Hey everyone, Victor is here and in this video I want to talk about this uh, two-step reaction in which it looks like we are doing a simple Williamson ether synthesis. We are starting with an alcohol, we are treating it with sodium hydride and then the alkyl halide. We are going to be seeing the formation of the corresponding ether, but here we're also seeing a bit of a twist because the carbon where the OH was all of a sudden flipped its stereo configuration and we know that it doesn't usually happen in, you know, Williams and Ether synthesis. So let's take a closer look and see if we can figure out what's going on here. Now let's start by redrawing our starting material. There we go. And the very first thing that I'm going to do here, I'm going to do the acid-base reaction because the sodium hydride that I have here as my first reagent, Na plus H minus, that is a very powerful base and it is pretty much never a nucleophile. So the first reasonable step on this mechanism is going to be just a simple acid-base reaction deprotonating our alcohol and giving us the corresponding alkoxide. Now, if we just added our alkyl halide and did a simple SN2 reaction like so, we would end up with the following ether, but as we know, that does not happen. So what else might be happening in this reaction? Well, let's look at our alkoxide. I'm going to copy this molecule one more time, and an interesting thing that I'm going to see about this molecule is that our oxygen with the negative charge over here, that oxygen is sitting on the beta position on the beta carbon. And this type of species, that is an intermediate in the aldol condensation or aldol addition reactions. And since those reactions are equilibria, that means that we can actually go back and break the bond between the alpha and beta atoms by essentially having this type of a cascade of the electron density so, in terms of my molecule, it means that I would have to take the electron pair on the oxygen, move it here, break a bond between the alpha and beta atoms, like so, and make the corresponding enolate. Now, the cool part about this enolate is that now we do have free rotation around the bond, around the single bond where my carbonyl is sitting, uh, the newly formed aldehyde that I just uh, made here, which means that that part of the molecule can freely rotate and it can rotate around, and when it rotates around, the enolate that I have on this molecule can re-react with my carbonyl, reforming this uh, beta-hydroxy or beta-oxy intermediate, but now oxygen is going to to be looking in the opposite direction. So, for the clarity's sake, what I'm going to do here, I'm actually going to show the equilibrium here, and I will redraw my aldehyde group in a different direction, so it's easier to see how it's going to close. So, now my enolate can re-react with this aldehyde like so, reforming the alpha-beta bond that we used to have, but now my oxygen is going to be looking in the opposite direction from where it used to be before. And since this entire transformation here is an equilibrium, I should technically be drawing my equilibrium arrows all the way through. Now, the reason why this conformation is significantly more stable than what we had to begin with, well, there are actually several reasons, but probably the main reason here is that the sodium ion that we had from the very beginning that we brought in with our base, because I remind you that the base that we used was sodium hydride, so that sodium didn't just disappear, so that sodium as the counter ion is sitting over here and this guy is coordinating at the same time at around both of those oxygens, essentially collating them and making them stick to each other, if you want to think about it this way, stabilizing this conformation. And now, when we go to the next step with our methyl iodide, we are going to have a reaction with this more stable conformation, which is going to be a predominant species in this solution, so this guy is going to react with our methyl iodide like so, giving us our final product. So what seemed like a simple inversion of stereo configuration was actually us breaking the 
the molecule and then reassembling it back, but in a different fashion. Which is something to be mindful about when you are seeing a reaction with the stereochemistry that does not necessarily agree with what we normally see in many, you know, simple reactions. Like in this case, there is no way we can do a simple SN2 reaction and uh, definitely not an SN1 reaction because we are working in strongly basic conditions. So, if those mechanisms don't work, you have to come up with something reasonable without inventing, you know, weird chemistry. Now, how did you do? Were you able to figure out this mechanism? Let me know in the comments below. And as always, thank you for watching. If you like this video, boop the like button, subscribe for more, and I will see you next time.